KCRW sponsors include A24, presenting Moonlight, a film chronicling three chapters in the life of a young black man, discovering his identity and experiencing first love as he moves from childhood into manhood. In theaters now. On To The Point, we try to make sense of the policy debates and the political sideshows on the campaign trail. Ted Cruz wrapping the bacon around the <laughs> semi-automatic weapon to cook it. I understand that trade is not a sexy issue. Nobody knows where the Republican Party is going to land. I mean, it's kind of like a country road. No one knows where it will end. In many ways, Marco Rubio is the Michael Jordan of American politics. I'm Warren Olney. To The Point has you covered for the 2016 campaign. Find the To The Point podcast on KCRW's iTunes page. From KCRW Santa Monica and KCRW.com, it's The Treatment. Welcome to The Treatment. I'm Elvis Mitchell. If you've seen the films Anchorman or Talladega Nights or any number of great funny or die things, you have a sense maybe what Adam McKay can do as a writer-director. But I think for those people who thought that he wasn't capable of doing something interesting and smart, didn't see the closing credits of The Other Guys, which is the funniest, meanest take on the excesses of the early part of the 21st century you will ever see. His newest film as director and co-writer is the adaptation of The Big Short. Adam, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Let's talk a little bit about that closing credits of The Other Guys, which I show people. It was funny, you know, we designed that movie to be like a comedy parable of the collapse and kind of the Madoff story. And what I didn't realize was, you know, when you have big funny bits that the audience is roaring at, and there's some some pretty darn good bits in that movie, it obscured the kind of backstory of it. So when I put those credits in, I felt like it was a natural extension of the whole movie. And people were really surprised by the credits when they hit. People were like, where did that come from? And a few people caught what the movie was really about. You know, the Steve Coogan character was from like the Center for American Capitalism. And (laughs) we had all these kind of stories in the background. But that was what led me to really start researching economics and finance and reading books. And and I've always been a guy who's been interested in politics. But out of that came a realization that, oh, wait a minute, 80% of politics is finance and economics. Well, so much, though, what you've done in, in these films, though, has been about not only politics, but what I love that you tend to do so often in these movies is your movies are about people who are socially awkward. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we look at the protagonists of all these films. There's one guy who's socially awkward, Ricky Bobby and Talladega Nights, and another guy who's very smooth. And that dynamic of that awkwardness, that these guys who are almost on the scale in some way, who don't know how to relate to people, and somebody else who's more socially advanced... Where does that come from for you, those those kind of opposites? It's very interesting. We, we've talked about it a lot. I mean, we obviously just kind of write it and we like it, which mm-hmm. is why we write it. But I think if you step back at it, it's always kind of a reflection on the idea, like, what does it mean to be an adult? What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be an American man specifically? Like, what are the expectations that are put on you? And if you look at Ricky Bobby, he's a very awkward guy. He didn't really have a dad and didn't know what to do. And then all of a sudden he starts winning. And, you know, hey, there's nothing more American than winning. So his whole personality is built around winning. And then when he loses the winning, he doesn't know who he is anymore. And Ron Burgundy is the same way. You know, Ron Burgundy is, you know, number one in San Diego and just thinks that's it. I've figured it out. But, like, there's a part of him that knows that it's not it. There's part of him that knows that he's lonely. So, you know, Will is very good at playing incredibly cocky characters who should not be that cocky. And I think that sort of vulnerability is kind of the key to, you know, what we do with the characters, that he always has a part of himself that is vulnerable, that we write into the characters. So even though he's number one, even though he's the big shot American man, I really think Step Brothers, in a way, is really the movie that kind of, like, laid it naked. Oh, what's what those guys would be like in real life? Uh, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I mean, those, you know, I'm a comic book fan. I've met those guys at comic book stores. So, and God bless them. They watch a lot of our movies. So, I mean, those guys, they're number one on video games. They're number one on watching TV. They're number one on wearing Chewbacca masks. But when it comes to the real world, you know, they're totally lost. I think we've all, well, maybe we haven't all had those days. I've had those days where the best thing I can do is channel flip, you know. 
But as you're talking about this, one of the things that also, and it actually gets to Christian Bale's character, uh, Burry here in the film, is that these guys who are socially awkward but have a talent. Yeah. I mean, these guys who don't really fit in anywhere, like Will's character in The Other Guys or in, in Talladega Nights or in Anchorman. I mean, these are guys who have something they can do. They have this talent, but they don't know how to relate to people. And I wonder, because that's the interesting thing, that they have this one thing that they can do. It's almost these these savants who don't have any real people skills. And I, I guess I wonder where that comes from for you, too. I think we all have parts of our lives where we're very comfortable other parts of our lives where we're not as comfortable. I mean, I always think of the story of, you know, one of the great titans of the 20th century, Charlie Parker, who, when it came to him playing the saxophone in front of a crowd or recording, he's the greatest in the world. But when it came to him having to deal with his girlfriend, having to deal with going to the store, he couldn't deal with that disconnect. So obviously he went to drugs. Uh, there's a great story I heard one time I was skiing and I was falling all over the place because I'm a terrible skier. And a guy came up to me and he said, you know, it's hard to ski when you're tall. I'm 6'5". He goes, I saw Michael Jordan here about eight years ago. And Jordan had never skied. And he just said, give me the skis. I'm going on the Black Diamond. And the guy told him, he goes, you know, you really should go. He goes, I'm Michael Jordan. Give me the skis. I'm going on the Black Diamond. And he couldn't get down the hill. And he couldn't comprehend that he's the greatest basketball player ever yet he's got to start on a baby green slope. And, and I think that's kind of the way we all are to less extremes, obviously. I think we all have areas where we're comfortable and areas where we're not. And Burry's an extreme example of that. I mean, he's a guy who, when he's in his world, he is an uber genius. I mean, the Wall Street world really respects him. But when he had to go out and try and raise money to short the housing market, he tried to start a fund. He couldn't do it. He tried to speak to people. You know, he doesn't make eye contact. He's awkward. Uh, no one would give him money. So he ended up doing it out of his own fund. But uh, it's an interesting question, that idea of our powers versus, you know, our vulnerabilities and the I, I, way they interact. Well, yeah. it's a, for me, in a lot of your work, by the way, it's a treatment, my guess, is Adam McKay, whose new film as director and co-writer is The Big Short, the edition of Michael Lewis's book. For me... So much of these things in your work is a, are about left brain, right brain, and how they can be at war in a, in a single person. Again, in everything that you've basically done, that, that you've written on, there is that character who has that schism between this thing that he can do and that he shouldn't be able to do, or maybe shouldn't be able, I don't know, but also his inability to communicate. And also, and there's always, too, like a larger narrative that's playing out, like a really big institutional narrative. Sure. And that's something that interests you, too, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, definitely what drew me to this book was I feel like Michael Lewis is a guy who is able to capture the human effect behind ideas and institutions probably better than any writer out there right now. I mean, he's a master of it. You know, I, I think we're right now in our society, we're not really talking about ideas and the impact of ideas as much as we have in the past. And what Lewis did with The Big Short was he connected characters and people and how they were affected by this one big idea, which are financial derivatives or in layman's terms, you know, mortgage mortgage bonds, which had never existed before the late 70s, bundling mortgages and selling them to other institutions and how that completely changed American culture. You know, banks grew four times the size they were in the 70s and the amount of money that it generated and the amount of corruption. I, I just think, though, this is, by the way, this is a point where I can, I should ask you, for people who haven't seen the movie yet, to tell them what The Big Short is about. We're talking in abstract terms about what you do. Uh, well, The Big Short, quite simply, is about a group of six or seven people, outsiders, weirdos, as we were just talking about, who are very skilled at what they do, who discover that the entire world economy is a lie. And they discover that there is a massive housing bubble that is propped up by levels of compromised institutions like the ratings agencies, the SEC, the government, the Fed, the big banks. And this small group of people saw it and no one would believe them. And they shorted it, which is a financial term for bet against. And it's one of those things where it's the odds are so good, even if you don't like the team, you had to take them. And, you know, I also think these guys believed in the market. I think they believe that when there's a bad investment, your job is to do a counter investment. And that's the way the market works. So coming into it, they didn't know they were betting against everything. They just thought they were doing their job as market investors. 
And you'll see, you know, in the movie, there's a turn where they realize how much bigger it is. I, I, we kept joking, uh, we kept referencing Three Days of the Condor, which the movie's really nothing like. But, you know, those 70s movies like Parallax View and Three Days of the Condor always have the moment where it's bigger than all of us. It's bigger than we realized. And the crazy thing is this is a true story, and they definitely had that moment where they realize it's bigger than all of us. It really is. I'm glad you mentioned that. It's a comedy version of the paranoid premise of 70s movies. Yeah. And, and there's so That's many... true. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I think, though, it, it falls into so many of your sweet spots as, as, a, as a creative force. I mean, this idea of this group of guys who really don't belong anywhere else except with each other, that there's this institutional lie, be it the institutional lie of, of NASCAR or of broadcast journalism of the 70s or the New York Police Department and the investment world even being touched on in the other guys. This idea of an institutional narrative that people believe long past the point where they should have believed in it is something that you connect to, too, isn't it? You know, it is. It's funny. I was just talking to Judd Apatow recently. I, I'm, I'm not name-dropping, but he... Uh, well, you know, so it's okay. I, I totally name-dropped. I, I admit it. <laughs> and he said the exact same thing to me. He said, you've always been interested in these questions of corrupt institutions, of larger forces. And he was kind of laughing, and he's like, you know, he's he was telling me I'm more interested in relationships. And he goes, but through knowing you, we end up talking about it a lot. And he was kind of asking me, like, why are you interested in these things? And I, I had a hard time giving him an answer. But I think the one thing I was, I, I was talking to my wife about it is that I grew up in the 70s, and we were pretty poor. My mom was a waitress, single mom. Where'd you grow up? Uh, we lived in Worcester, Massachusetts, pretty tough area of Worcester. And then outside Philadelphia, um, ended up going to Temple University. and But definitely like a lower middle class upbringing. And I think I actually got to see kind of the good side of some institutions because... Well, in the 70s, there were like all kinds of things, educational things to support people. There were social constructs that still existed from the Johnson era. Absolutely. And my mom got like Pell Grants and was able to go back to college and get her degree. I actually went to public schools that were really good. As did I. Yeah, and ended up going to Temple University, which is a subsidized school, and got a very good education there. So I always grew up, and then, you know, I had a family that paid attention to politics, but I always grew up thinking, yeah, there's problems with the government, there's problems with institutions, but they really can work. And then I got to see, as I got older in the 80s, you know, sort of the, there's that book by George Packer, The Unwinding. I got to kind of see that happen firsthand. And it was a bit of a shock to just see the consciousness of our country change and go against government and unions and institutions. So I also saw how it affected people, too. It really made a change on our culture, and our culture changed radically. And there was never really a discussion about it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of endlessly fascinated by how that affects people. And then I happen to go through comedy, so I, I tend to focus on how the, the funny aspects of it. But there's still this, this is idea that, it's certainly corruption is there, but I think it's more a kind of inertia that nobody bothers to question. It's, like, it's almost like the wizard is sitting there with a the curtain wide open and nobody's noticing that he's not a wizard. <laughs> they're, still, they're still listening to him talk through this microphone, and, but everybody sees it. Or rather, it's visible to everybody, but people choose to not acknowledge it. I, you know, I think there's also I, it, there's another theory I've heard that the change is happening so fast now that you're seeing cultural changes that used to take decades to happen are now happening in like a year or two. And then the other thing, I think the biggest change was, in, and this goes back to one of my all-time favorite movies, Broadcast News. I think when you started to see news journalism like really dismantled, when they got rid of the Fairness Doctrine, when they got rid of... And also when, the, when the, basically the Tisch family said that the news division has to make a profit. Yes, and they folded it into the entertainment division. Sure. Uh, one of the guys I work with at Funny or Die, Owen Burke, his dad was David Burke, who was oh. uh, famous, you know, ran ABC News, created Nightline, and he quit when that happened. He quit the news when they folded it into the entertainment division. And to his dying day, Owen would ask him, what do you think of the news nowadays? And he would, go, he would say, there is no news nowadays. And I think, I think that's been a major player, the fact that people have sort of lost like an objective context for what's going on and the news turned in new opinions and that most people don't know the difference between an opinion and a fact. Anyway, we're going very far abstract here, but but still it's germane to what we're talking about. And, and the changes you see in the big short really reflect that, that banking grew four times its size and yet we never talked about that. But as Burry mentions in, in the movie, and it's certainly... Lewis goes into great detail in the book. There was an historical antecedent for this in the Depression. Yes. So all these other factors that are like 
blossoming and distracting of science, there still was a precedent for this, that the idea that, you know, there could be a housing bubble, that housing wasn't this inviolate physical law that could never disappear. Absolutely. And I mean, if you look at the conditions that led to the Great Depression, it's remarkable how similar they are to where we are now as far as rates of income inequality. I mean, people forget, like, we had boom-bust cycles in the late 19th century into the early 20th. Every five, six years, there were giant crashes that eventually led to the creation of the Fed. And then, obviously, we had the Great Depression. We put in all these great regulations. We had no boom bust for about 40 or 50 years. But we also built a, an infrastructure that produced jobs and all these kinds of things. That, that... And education. And then what did we do? We got rid of those regulations. And, and by the way, that's not a right-left thing. That's Reagan and Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton got rid of a lot of those regulations. And, well, he got rid of Glass-Steagall. Exactly. Uh, you know, with Phil Graham. So, so uh, <laughs> I'm not letting Phil Graham off the hook for that. He wrote the bill. He wrote the bill. We can get into a whole conversation about Bill Clinton basically dismantled the welfare system that's led to a permanent underclass. But that's, but that's for left, right, and center. That's absolutely, not why we're here. Absolutely. That's not why we're here. Yeah, but it is not. I, I do emphasize that with the big short. Like, this is not a right-left issue. It's an up-down issue. And my mom and her husband are hardcore right-wingers. They watch Fox every night, and they love the movie. And by the way, I know it's my mom. She would tell me if she did not like the movie. <laughs> And I was like, you guys liked it, really? And they're like, yeah, it's all true. Why wouldn't we like it? I was stunned. I couldn't believe it. We'll take a break. We just heard from Adam McKay's toughest critic, his mom. His new film is director and writer is The Big Short. It's the treatment. There's more to come. Stay with us. <laughs> <laughs> Browse the KCRW store and shop for vacations, wine classes, frequent flyer miles, dinners, and merchandise. Shop to support KCRW only at kcrw.com slash store. Welcome back. It's The Treatment. My guest is Adam McKay, whose new film as director and co-writer is The Big Short. We were just talking to you in the break about your time with Michael Moore, who's also somebody who a Michigander like me, but also somebody who deals with the idea of the institutional lie. Uh, that, and then some uh, about asking questions that so many people just follow that because they're really not bred to ask questions anymore. I, I wrote on his show years ago, God, was that like 15 years ago, a show called The Awful oh, Truth. Yeah. But the thing I always remember from Michael Moore is like he's been kind of pigeonholed as like a big lefty now. But like when he did Roger and Me, that was not a right-wing, left-wing movie. That was about outsourcing, and he was the first guy to catch it. He was the first one to talk about our jobs leaving America. But that and used to be not... That narrative was about the creation of the middle class in this country. Which the Republicans participated in a huge way. Eisenhower was instrumental. People forget that Nixon, you know, passed, uh, you know, created the EPA, EPA. and food stamps. Like... Uh, there used to not be this division, and it wasn't until free trade really came along in the late 70s that you saw a completely different Republican Party kind of sprout up. So, yeah, this is something I've always been interested in. You know, I used to write for the Huffington Post quite a bit, and so I've always just felt like being aware, being active is just like, you know, it's about 10% of who I am. I like to watch basketball and boxing. I like to laugh. I like to do comedy. I have a million other things I like. I love Korean food and sushi, but <laughs> I... <laughs> I also go for a half an hour every week and I look up stuff on the internet and I do research and I try and be informed and somehow it became like this either or thing where like I'm not into politics. Well, too bad. Politics is into you, whether you like it or not, you know. Well, I just think the way you're built as a creative person lends itself to these kinds of things. And you can certainly say in effect that everything you've done as a filmmaker has somehow or another been about politics. Because again, it's all about people being inside these institutions that they haven't bothered to ask questions about. Yeah. And that's an interesting take on comedy because it's it's saying that there's a worldview that exists in the comedy. It's not just about two people trying to figure out how their humdrum lives are going to get along or not. There's always a bigger picture. And that basically these institutions that are about to teeter and fall, but nobody's noticed how precarious their positions are. It's really interesting. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. And we always look for the comedians that can play that moment of just quickly saying yes. It, it, it's funny because it's counter to a lot of drama. A lot of drama, you want that internal conflict. And the conflict is key. With comedy, 
Nothing makes me laugh harder than Will just quickly saying yes to a bad idea. And the conflict is almost on the audience, which is why we're laughing like, wait a minute, did he just ignore the fact that there's a lot of questions there? And so then the conflict falls on us as the audience, which is then why we start laughing because we know it's a terrible idea. But yeah, I, 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 it's an interesting thought. Certainly with the Anchorman movies, we were very aware of the fact that we were given a big jab to the local news, like what happened to the local news, that it's all animal stories and if it bleeds, it leads. And, you know, with Talladega Nights, that was during the peak of the Bush years when he had 90% approval. And, you know, even though we have family from the South and I love large swaths of the South, we wanted to kind of investigate that pride. And Ricky Bobby was definitely a guy who was not asking a lot of questions. That's for sure. Yeah, that idea of not asking questions. I mean, I just, that's really fertile ground for comedy because it's allowed you to stake a claim on a piece of territory that nobody else is working. And it's not explicitly political at all. In fact, it sort of demands that you pay attention because there are so many big moments that are about basically seeing these guys at their best do these things. I mean, seeing Steve Carell in this in this film or, or just watching that great team he's got with Hamish Linklater and, and, and Ray Spall. I mean, it's all comic timing being used to push across these incredibly complicated ideas. And in case the ideas are too complicated, we get to see Margot Robbie or <laughs> Selena Gomez or Tony Bourdain explain something to us. In case there's too much going on in the movie. Yeah, that was an interesting thing that came out of this. I mean, and it goes back to your asking questions thing. We just started talking about, like, how can it be that billions of people did not see this housing bubble when all you have to do is look at one chart that shows housing flat for 90 years, and then suddenly it takes off like a rocket. It's the most obvious bubble ever. And how did only this little collection of guys, and there's a few others that we don't depict in the movie who also saw it, and some writers who saw it, so right away, it goes to asking questions like, what is our culture telling us? Are we being told what we need to be told? What is our news telling us? What are the people around us telling us? And that led to what you're talking about with Selena Gomez, Margot Robbie, and Tony Bourdain coming in. We then said, well, what if pop culture told us things we needed to know? My God, what would our country be if Britney Spears was singing a song about currency rates and how when the dollar's strong, it's not always good? Sometimes be, you want be, to do it. It would be Berlin, <laughs> Weimar Republic is what it would be. But I, 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 I wonder how far back this goes for you, this idea of basically taking a concept and then playing the comedy out around it. I mean, because we can sit here and talk about the, the big comedic moments from all these movies. And up until the big short, people have to sort of really give it some thought to understand that there was more going on, that there's subtext and text in these movies. That was a question Will and I always had, because I remember reading an article about um, who was the general that did the Rolling Stone expose? Was it McChrystal? Yeah. The second paragraph of the article, talking about how this guy's going around partying, he's with his Yahoo friends, uh, is that he says his favorite movie is Talladega Nights. And Pharaoh and I were like, does he really know what that movie's about? And... (laughs) You know, what we love about those comedies is they play everywhere. They play them in Kentucky, they play them in North Dakota, they play them in Alaska, and these movies get seen by crowds that don't go see, you know, some of these awards movies that aren't going to go see necessarily Spotlight or The Big Short. So that's what we love about these movies, but it's an interesting question about how much of that subtext is really reading, how aware of it are they, and... Yeah, I think that's why I was excited to do the big short was like, what happens if we go completely overt? Like, it's just the subtext is now on the surface. Doesn't mean we're not using our skills to still have it be entertaining. Doesn't mean we don't have great actors. Doesn't mean occasionally you're not going to laugh. But that was what was so interesting about this leap was, you know, what happens if it's naked, if it's right in front of you? Well, so much of comedy, though, is about tension anyway. Mm -hmm. And, And the idea of, like, making this tension visible part of the texture I thought was really funny. You know, the only movie we did it with, because there's kind of this rule in comedy that you don't move the camera too much. Exactly. That's yeah. all masters. Exactly. Yeah. Like you were saying. And then Woody Allen obviously kind of invented that in a way. Or, although I'm sure it goes back. Oh, no. The Marx Brothers, of course, did that. Well, yeah. If you can basically say boo save from drowning is all camera moving. And, and But anyway, it doesn't happen a lot. It doesn't happen a lot. And the one movie we did it on was Step Brothers. Because, you know, I had Oliver Wood. Right. Who right. worked with Greengrass before and did those. Uh, the Bloody Sunday. Sunday yeah, Bloody Sunday. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to remember if he shot that but he's done the green grass style before the yeah. handheld so i told him on Step Brothers, i go let's move the camera a little bit let's go handheld and it's a very scary thing in comedy and i said let's not go nuts we don't need to do you know united 93 as far as how much we're going to be moving or 
I'm trying to think of those other movies. Sunday Bloody Sunday, you know, we're not going to go, or uh, Costa Gravas, or, you know. So that's the one movie we ever let the camera off the sticks and off the dolly on, and I loved it. I And it was cool. We did it very subtly, but there are other times it gets, like, more pronounced. And then on but this whole thing with, with, with Catherine Hahn and John in, the, in, that, in oh, that men's room. I oh, mean, my that's, God. That's almost like it's, it's a scary documentary there. Totally, totally. And there is. There is like a darker edge to it because we're off the sticks when we're doing that. And from that moment on, I was like, I'm never going back on the sticks again. I mean, that's it. I, Anchorman's a weird thing because it's so period. So we, so we you, probably you, kinda, you have to do like almost classical framing for that. Because also, you want to see how big those rooms are and the, the people milling around. In exactly. Them. We kind of had to with that. So I almost don't count that. But what shocked me with this movie is you have Barry Aykroyd, who's the master of the style, the, the kind of neo-verite style. And yet we were getting big laughs in a lot of these scenes. And I was like, whoa, because we're, we're fully going there with Ackroyd on this. And I was getting, I was like, wow, I think you can fully do this with comedy. I, so I'm excited for the next comedy I do. I want to take a plunge into this kind of uh, green grass, winter bottom, Barry Ackroyd kind of <laughs> Ken Loach kind of style and see if they can, can we get, do a feral John C. Riley comedy and shoot it like that and still get laughs. It's a treatment. We're talking comedy verite with my guest, Adam McKay, <laughs> whose new film is director <laughs> is The Big Short. But as you talk about this, you realize that, you know, 24-Hour Party People does that, too. 24-Hour Party People is one of my all-time favorite movies. Huge influence on this movie. Mm-hmm. It was the first movie I ever saw. Maybe American Splendor a little bit. Obviously, Annie Hall did it a bit. Where they broke the fourth wall in a way that was so smart, so energetic, and yet I didn't lose the emotional thread because obviously that's why you don't want to break the fourth wall. So when I saw 24-Hour Party People, and I'd done it in theater back in the 90s in Chicago, I'd broken the fourth wall and played with it, but that was the movie where I thought you can do this. And when I read The Big Short, I knew you had to break the fourth wall. And the reason I wasn't completely terrified was because I'd seen 24-Hour Party People. It's like, you can pull this off. Because I bring it up because it was the first thing I thought about as I'm watching it. I mean, just that musical thing is almost... And that movie, too, is filled with this kind of tension. It's also basically about this institutional lie. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these things, and one person who's got that combination of both awkward and smooth at the same time. Yes, yes. But also coming into contact with all these different tribes of people, which are frankly something that happens in a lot of your movies, too. We go from one kind of space to another kind of space inhabited by all these different kinds of people. And I just found myself thinking about that a lot. And I wanted to ask you about it because I hadn't seen it mentioned anywhere at all. But I wondered if that was an impact. Huge impact. I, I've probably seen that movie 15 times. I mean, that is, I watch certain movies over and over again. Children of Men, believe it or not, was kind of an impact. No, I get that because that movement. Exactly, exactly. So I, And I liked how in Children of Men, how they blended the traditional Dolly frame with the verite style, which is a little bit of what we do in this movie. So it I, starts off in a Dolly frame in a lot of shots, so then it goes off the sticks onto handheld. Exactly, exactly. So I watched that movie a lot, and then 24-Hour Party People, to me, was like kind of the... That's what I told my editor. I go, okay, you want to know what I want to do with this movie? Not exactly. We're going to do it differently than 24-Hour Party People, but that's the closest I've seen to kind of what I'm thinking. And then Hank Corwin watched it. And had a big smile on his face, and he was like, "It's on." And he knew he knew he had a green light to go for it after we'd watched that. Winterbottom's a genius. I, I love him. He's one of my favorite directors. Like The Trip is one of my all-time favorite movies. Sure. And, uh, yeah, he's brilliant. And I'm guessing that's why you brought Steve Coogan in on 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 the other guys in the first 100%, place. Because 100%. Because it was like a Winterbottom collaboration. And Alan Partridge, of course. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> I'm sorry, Adam, we're out of time. Will you come and do the show again, please? I would love to. This was really fun, man. Completely my pleasure. My guest, again, comedy verite, but it's a funny movie. All these, we're talking very big, abstract ideas. It's full of energy. It's really fun. The movie is The Big Short. Its director is Adam McKay. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you, Elvis. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Our technical director here at NPR West is Marcia Conwell. The show is mixed by Kat Yor. It's edited by Blake Fight, who's the associate producer. I got plenty left to talk about, but we're out of time. It's the treatment. To catch up on past episodes of The Treatment, go to kcrw.com or listen on your smartphone with KCRW's mobile apps or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen to podcasts. The Treatment is produced and distributed by KCRW Santa Monica. 